Okay, all right. Ed, welcome everyone. Thank you, Jonathan. So we are in our third lecture on the sports, on communication, sports and media. And I uh, welcome, I'm sorry, so Zoom is pop up some, something for me, here, but all right. I welcome today Jonathan Finn, Professor Jonathan Finn from Wilfred, Wilfred Laurier University in Canada. And it's a great pleasure to have you here, Jonathan. And I hope that everyone will like your, your presentation, your ideas and your books so much as do I. So uh, Jonathan Finn holds a PhD in Visual and Cultural Studies from the University of Rochester, Rochester and a Master in Art History from New York University. He is a faculty member of Wilfrid Laurier University. And he, he serves and teaches in the areas of visual communication, visual cultural studies, and sports studies. He's the author of Beyond the Finish Line, Images, Evidence, and History of the Photo Finish, published by McGill University Press in 2020. And it's a very great book. It's a very nice book. And it's a pleasure to have you here, Jonathan. And I hope that we can see your presentation, chat a bit more afterwards. But it's a great pleasure to have you here. So the floor is, is yours. Thanks so much. Great. Yeah, thank you very much, Marcio. Um, thanks, everybody, for uh, coming. And um, I watched the two previous videos. And I'm going to repeat what, what both they said, which is that if you have any questions along the way, or want me to repeat something, you can put it in the chat. You can just yell out if I'm not paying attention or anything like that. So um, I won't take offense by any stretch at all. And I know that sitting through Zoom can be difficult. <laughs> so I appreciate your willingness to do that. Uh, but by all means, if you if you need a break and you want to ask a question, just, just go right ahead. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can't. And so my talk today is uh, there's no such thing as a dead heat, myths of accuracy and objectivity in the photo finish. Marcio already gave some context for this in terms of uh, my work, but just to reiterate the I, I broadly interested in visual communication, um, specifically history and theory of photography, and the way in which images are used in making claims to truth and evidence and objectivity. So you're seeing three books there, the, the leftmost being the result of PhD research on the history of police photography. The middle one is kind of a textbook on visual communication and culture. And then the one on the right is the one that Marcio uh, mentioned, which is the uh, beyond the finish line, images, evidence, and the history of the photo finish. And so it's that last one that I'm going to be um, presenting on today. I did want to point out what I'm currently working on, which is this, which is uh, self-tracking in um, endurance sports, specifically running, cycling, triathlon. And my interests there uh, are many, but one of which is certainly the visualization of our physiological output. So the visualization of running, the visualization of hiking, walking, swimming, um, and the ways in which this, this you know, can alter or change our embodied experience of these activities. Um, so that's where I'm at now. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'm happy to talk about any of the, the topics that I just introduced. So I'm going to begin with where this project began for me, which is this race here, which is the 2012 US Olympic trials, and in particular, the women's 100 meter. So I'm going to show a short uh, clip from this. There's a false start. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the athletes being introduced, and then I'm going to skip past the false start to the um, actual event. Um, it is a somebody recorded it off of their television. So it's not a particularly good recording but it's important to get the broadcast. And so it's an NBC broadcast and that's kind of um, an essential part of the discussion. So I wanted us to have that. And in lane one will be Geneva Tarmo. 
And this is a young lady rapidly improving throughout these rounds. A personal best of 11.13, and she ran very close to that in her semifinal. She trains with Allison Felix. And Allison is next door in lane two. Tom, she has to bring some aggression. A 200-meter mentality or a 400-meter mindset will not get it done today. She has to be aggressive and ferocious in that first half of the race to make this team. In lane three, just finished her sophomore year at the University of Oregon, English Gardner. And after a shaky first round, she recovered very well, running 11-10 in her semifinal. She definitely can make this team. It's going to take a near-perfect race. Tiana Madison, lane four. Tiana Madison has separated herself from everybody else in this field, not named Carmelita Jetter. Running personal bests all throughout this season. She ran 10.96 to win her semifinal and looked very good doing it. Lane five is Alex Anderson. And Alex Anderson has not raced that much this year, but 11.12 in her semifinal, not to mention having a nice lane draw in between Madison and Jetter, should bode well for her chances. World champion Jetter, Carmelita Jetter, lane six. So many questions coming into these trials. She had lost her last three races. Those questions have been answered. The world champion seems like she is back to the form that saw her become the world's second fastest woman ever. In lane seven is Bianca Knight. Better at 200, but running very well. She likes this track because her personal best was set on this track back in 2008. Anderson, apparently, was the one with hands on the line. We had a headwind in the hurdles. That wind has disappeared. Could be a fast time here. Okay, so it was this this race that got me intrigued in the photo finish in part because of a really big controversy that unfolded after this result. And so what you saw there was a very clear indication of who's first and second, but the spot for third comes down to the photo finish. And uh, about 20, 25 seconds transpire between the placing of first and second, and then the announcement for third. And for those who are track and field fans, um, you know, that's relatively uncommon. We're typically used to the results being quite automatic, or, right? They come up on the infield scoreboard, they go into the broadcast almost instantaneously, which gives you a, a, a sense that this is all being automated, that there's no, no human official um, at work here. And what came to um, the four in this example was the work of humans behind the scenes in trying to figure out who crossed in third place. So the reason that this was such a momentous decision was the is because of the way the U.S. determines its Olympic team. And so they have uh, the trials, which, sorry, this is track and field specifically. They have the trials, which is a competition a few months before the Olympic Games, and the top three finishers in each event go to the Olympics. So it doesn't matter what you did all year. You could have won every single race by a wide margin. And if you false start or you have a bad day at the trials, you don't go to the Olympics. Um, and so the US ATF have 
the United States Track and Field Association, they have procedures in place to in order what to do for a, a tie. The problem is, it's a very unique problem to this event, is that what they normally do with a tie is they just award the same place. So a tie for first, you have two first place. Tie for second, same thing. Tie for third, same thing. The difficulty is when you get into the Olympic trials and the top three go to the Olympics. So if you have a tie for first, it's no problem. You have first, first, second, go to the Olympics. Tie for second, no problem. For first, second, second, go to the Olympics. Tie for third, you have first, second, third, third. So that's where they ran into a problem. And that's why this determination had to be made. Otherwise, they would just give Felix and Tarmo the same time of 11.07 and move on. But they had to have a decision for third place. So what happens after this is Tarmo is whisked away to do um, doping testing and she has an American flag draped around her. They're starting to do the press conferences of like, you know, you've just made your first Olympic team. How does it feel? You're going to be representing the country. Allison Felix is on the infield. She starts crying because she hasn't made the team in the hundred. All the while, the, the officials responsible for the decision are starting to converse. And Roger Jennings, the guy who's the finish line judge, the photo finish judge in this case, calls down to the on-field official, a guy named Bob Podkeminer, who's in charge of the whole event, and says to him, I'm a little uneasy about that decision that I just made, that we need to chat. So they get together, and I'll talk about this a little bit more. They get together and chat and ultimately decide that it's a tie. They can't, they can't determine whether Felix or Tarmo crossed the line ahead of the other. And so 45 minutes after the initial decision is made, they announce that it's a dead heat. Tarmo's already well into drug testing. Felix is moving on to something else. They're, they both have to run the 200 in a subsequent day. You know, other events are going by. And so this announcement comes out kind of behind the scenes, causes a lot of confusion and controversy which is made even worse when they have to announce it's a tie and we don't have procedures in place for what to do in the event of a tie. So then they say to the athletes, give us 24 hours and we're gonna come up with procedures. The procedures themselves become quite funny and they get the USATF gets ridiculed for those as well. So the procedures are, you can agree to a runoff, we can flip a coin or you can concede. And there's a there's a uh, a caveat in there, which is that if one person agrees to a runoff, the other person has to agree or concede. So Felix says, "I want to do a runoff," and so Tarmo then is the position where she either has to concede her spot or agree to the runoff, and she says, "I'll do the runoff." So this then is going to become a prime time battle. And so this, this accident turns into something that's going to be a, a, a mega media event. So NBC is starting to promote this as, uh, you know, a unique kind of prime time runoff between just two runners on the track running for that final Olympic spot, right? So the media machine starts running. This is going to be a great uh, media spectacle. A little while after Tarmo makes her announcement that she's going to do the runoff, she says, no, I'm not going to. I'm changing my mind. I'm dropping out. Her rationale that she told everyone at the time was that she want, she had third place, that the photo finish expert said she had third. The decision was that she had third. And so to agree to the runoff would be to agree that she did not get third place. And so she drops out. Felix goes to the Olympics in her spot. Now, there's a lot more that goes on <laughs> behind that. They're training partners. They have the same coach. There's all kinds of great backstory. Um, you could do an entire book about it. The reason I became so fascinated by it was, so I'm a runner, so I'm interested in it from that regard. But as a visual comm person, I kept thinking, surely there's an image on that photo finish camera that shows one athlete crossing ahead of the other. And so I started to do some research into this final to figure out um, what had happened. So through that, I come across uh, that it's Finish Links is the company that produces the images for the for the USA track and field finals. 
And I start to have conversations with one of the guys that works at the company, a guy named Giles Norton, who no longer works there. He's giving me some images of how the decision is made. And I start to find out the very the, the um, intensive level of work involved in doing photo finish. So what you're seeing here is the image captured by the photo finish camera that goes up to the photo finish judge. In this case, the guy named Roger Jennings, who's sitting up in a booth at the track with his laptop open. And each one of these red lines is the result of him clicking on the forward most point of an athlete's torso, because that's how you determine placing in track and field. So this image comes up. Jennings is click, 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 click. The software he has, which is proprietary and, and their company owns it, produces a time based on this mouse click. And so that's where you get the athlete's times, 11.058, whatever the case may be. Those times are immediately sent down to the infield scoreboard. They're posted. Um, and this all happens in the blink of, seemingly in the blink of an eye, okay? So the more I found out about this, the more I became fascinated in how a decision couldn't have been made, right? Because this camera, which I'm showing here is the inside camera. There's two cameras, one on the inside of the track, one on the outside. This one's producing 3000 scans per second. And so to me, I thought, how is it that not one of those 3000 scans can separate Felix and Tarmo? So this image doesn't do it. This is the outside camera, which is producing even higher resolution, 5,000 scans per second. And this is Tarmo and Felix up here in the top. And this image can't separate them. So what happens is Jennings picks this image out, blows it up. This is the one that he's going to work on. So this, remember, this is all happening in that 20 to 25 seconds after the decision has been made, or after the initial decision has been made. And so he's now pouring over this image and he has a pr process that he uses called interpolation. Well, he calls it interpolation, where if he can't figure out the forwardmost point of the torso, he clicks a point on the athlete's bicep and a point on their bib. And then his software projects a point that is taken to be the forwardmost point of the torso. So he does this, it spits out a number of 11.067 for Tarmo and 11.068 for Felix. And so based on that, that's where the decision comes that Tarmo is first and Felix, or sorry, Tarmo is third and Felix is fourth. The difference being one one thousandth of a second. But because Jennings does this and because he couldn't tell through image alone, that's where he gets a easy. And so he phones down to the on-field officials and says, I'm a little bit uneasy about this decision. I think we need to have a chat. So one of the reasons, so then he and the officials, the other officials start pouring over these images. And because they can't determine it in the visual evidence alone, that's why they declare it a dead heat. One of the reasons being that they're nervous about the subjectivity of Jennings' decision might expose them to lawsuits or something else, right? So there's a really interesting recourse here too, because the image itself can't prove, even though Jennings is a recognized photo finish expert, and even though he has used this method of interpolation countless times and never had a problem, because of the particular gravity of this situation, there's unease about it. And so um, th that in a nutshell is how I started to research the photo finish, because the more I found out about it, I just became absolutely fascinated by it. Um, the other thing that I've put on this slide here is the scoreboard, which shows Tarmo and Felix's time at 11.07. And you'll notice there that all the results are posted to the hundredth. I'm going to come back at the very end of this talk of why that's important. But I just wanted you to see that for now. Okay. Uh, so this is just gives you a, a rough breakdown of the chronology of the photo finish, um, starting with this instantaneous photography movement in the late 1800s, a move towards electricity in the early 1900s, movie camera systems. Shortly after the introduction of movie camera systems, you have the development of the slit camera, which is the true photo finish camera. Following this, a period of uh, kind of normalization, commercialization, professionalization, that's, um, and Omega becomes the um, sort of de facto leader in that field. And then computerized, computerization and digitization from the, the 70s forward. 
the actual process doesn't really differ too much from the invention of the slit camera in 1937. So rather than go through that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about, it, about this uh, work across three main findings or themes from the research. The first one is the relationship between human and machine vision. The second one is discourses of automation and non-intervention. And then the last one is accuracy versus precision. That one's my favorite, <laughs> um, but they're all they're all equally important. Um, and I I I want to say sort of that the this dovetails really nicely, in particular, with what Marcus talked to you about in the seminar that he gave around notions of objectivity um, and non-interventionist objectivity, borrowing that idea from Lorraine Daston and, and Peter Gallison, and that very much was in, informing uh, the research that I was doing as well. So uh, the instantaneous photography movement, as I said, happens in the late 1800s, uh, continues into the early 1900s. And the, the, the most notable or, or the most sort of known figure of that movement is Moybridge. Um, and he's certainly not uh, the only person doing work. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of amateur photographers doing instantaneous work. The idea being an experiment to try and capture movement, right? So not, not using the, the camera to capture still lifes or portraits or anything like that, but capturing any and all kinds of movement. So beach scenes were particularly popular, people trying to capture waves, um, city scenes trying to capture movement of humans and horses, cars, anything like that. Um, and Moybridge becomes famous, of course, with his experiments for human and animal movement. Another one uh, is Marais with his uh, chronophotographic experiments. The idea here, though, is this uh, intensive interest in the closing decades of the 1800s around capturing human movement. And so it's kind of obvious that this that photographers would turn their camera onto sports. So there's a real discussion and discourse emerging um, in various periodicals um, and, uh, devoted to kind of amateur photography, uh, as well as outing and sporting um, events of people using the camera to explore documenting human movement. And so it starts to be seen then as a tool where we could potentially use this to determine race results. I'm showing you here three passages around the same time, Moybridge being the earliest, of people who start, photographers who, who start to talk very specifically about using the camera to determine the results of racing. So Moybridge, it is unnecessary for me to inform you that there can be no such thing as a dead heat. Uh, Lincoln Adams, saying, according to his, and he's referring to Ernest Marx, an early instantaneous photographer, according to his photographs, there is no such thing as a dead heat. And then John Hammett, some of my pictures showed that what had been considered dead heats were really not dead at all. In fact, my photographs proved what I had long suspected, that there was in reality no such thing as a dead heat. Um, so the, co the confidence is there. Um, and it's, uh, you know, for those who are, who are familiar with the history of image making, the history of photography, this is certainly something that was not unique to sport, right? This kind of confidence around the camera pervaded all kinds of disciplines that, that sought to use it for evidence record keeping, right? From kind of astronomy to criminology to its use in schools, hospitals. Uh, that that history has been has been well documented, right? And so it's represented here where there's this um, intense interest towards the closing years of the 1800s that we are going to have from here on in definitive answers to who won uh, racing contests. And it's primarily concerned with horse racing at this time. And Hemet becomes a very, very important figure in this regard. This image that I'm showing you here, the Salvatore versus Tenny match race from 1890, is often listed uh, as one of the first photo finish images. And um, as I argue in my book, it is decidedly not a photo finish. It's a photograph of a finish, the distinction of which I will talk about in a moment. Um, but it is nonetheless a very, very important historical document. Hemet was one of the most prolific sports photographers of the time, and he was employed as the official racetrack photographer for numerous horse racing tracks across the United States. He was also an accomplished skater, cyclist, um, and uh, tended to bring his camera along with those pursuits as well. 
So the discourse that built up and that I showed you in those previous quotes was very much around um, using the camera to, to fix what was perceived as a human problem, right? Which is the inability of the eye to determine which horse crosses in front of the others. Sorry, I was just looking at the chat. <laughs> and um, and so the camera, as in other pursuits, is, is seen and promoted as a way that we're going to fix this human problem. So Hemet is one of the people that's exploring this. And what you're seeing here is his preferred kind of setup. So he would have a white backdrop here across from the finishing post. You can hopefully barely make out this line that runs across the top. He's positioned over here where the judges would usually be positioned right on the finishing post. In this case, he's too high up. Ideally, he'd be lower down. So the white back, so the horses are captured against the white backdrop. But what it also shows, and the reason I like the photo so much, is that it actually shows an essential problem with this early use of the camera. And it's another human problem, which is reaction time, right? So the camera gets introduced to solve a problem, which is vision, human vision, because human vision can't precisely separate one horse from another. But it introduces another problem, which is reaction time. And what I mean by that is that Hemet has to be sitting there on the racing post and he has to snap that shutter release at exactly the right time. And what happened when I started looking at photographs from Hemet's um, archives in, the, in Lexington, Kentucky, is that he rarely, if ever, snapped an image that would work as a, as a um, decision-making tool. This one in the top left is you know, one of the closest. You can see that here he's pretty much got it where the horse's nose is right at the line. But even then, legally, it probably wouldn't stand up because it doesn't show the moment of, of the athlete horse or whatnot crossing the line. Okay, So it's the introduction of the, of the technology to solve a human problem, which is then confounded by another human problem of reaction time. Um, as a, an interesting but very important sidebar, at the same time that this is happening, there's intense commercial interest in, in race results. And so what you're seeing here in the spirit of the times, which is a really important uh, horse racing periodical at the time, these are illustrations based on Hemet's photographs because there tends, there's this big public interest in seeing race finishes. And what's fascinating about these, if you look at them, each one of them is showing the horse's nose right as it's crossing the line. Um, but we know that Hemet did not actually make these photos. So these are based on Hemet's photographs. And I have examples of the photograph with the drawing beside them. But the artists who are doing the illustrations are redepicting them as if Hemet got it right at the moment, right? So it's really, there's a really interesting slippage there between the kind of entertainment and commercial value of these and their use as evidentiary documents to determine race results. Just give me a second, I need to see if I can, there we go. Okay, so the second key discourse to emerge from this is this notion of automation and non-intervention. So in the same way that the camera gets introduced to try and fix human problems, increased technology gets introduced to, tr to try and further remove the human from officiating and race results. This one is a really fascinating document that I could, I could go on far too long about. But so this is a patent that uh, William Ephraim Barber develops and it's a system. And so uh, Marcy, so can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my cursor going here on the screen? Okay, perfect. So what you see here is a racing, a, a system, an automated system to develop a racing record of a horse race. And one of the things I want to point out is that there's no humans, right? Other than the jockeys. So you have your ele electromagnetic um, system down here hooked up to your camera, your photo finish camera, which runs across here. Um, runs over to a clock and there's an information scoreboard here. And so what you can see down at the bottom is what this image is going to look like when the photograph is taken. So the way it works is you set up your circuit at the beginning of the race, the horses trip the circuit and that releases the clock and the photograph. So the camera takes a picture of the clock. So you get the time and a picture of the information of who's riding what horse and their number. And then you reset the circuit after the horses and jockeys leave. And then when they come around, they trip the circuit 
circuit again. And so you get your finishing photograph, which is going to show the clock and how much time has elapsed, your jockey information on here. Um, and so you have this complete photographic record that's going to give you the start and finish. And again, I kept thinking back on this when Marcus was talking about the difference between the, or the usage of data and um, uh, images. And so there's a there's a really concerted effort here to capture more and more racing information within a static image, right? In this is the 1890s. It's incredible to me that this is uh, how advanced this was and how quickly this developed. This, of course, did not just radically transform things. And as, as with a lot of um, the discourse around photography, it's really important not to not to assume or think that the camera came in and suddenly got rid of humans as, as officiants. That was absolutely not the case. Um, so what you see here is a kind of, uh, what, media in between uh, fully automated and, and fully human systems. So you have your photo finish person up here, sorry. Yeah, your photographer up here, who's gonna take a shot of the finish line. And all of, all of these are your timers. And so at the time, this is uh, 1912, each timer is assigned to one lane and they're, they're going to record their athlete as well as the athlete who finishes before and after their athlete. And then you get together at the end, you consolidate all the times and those are your official results and you have your photographic record. What happens over the years is increased um, automation of these. So it goes from these individuals depressing stopwatches to um, electromagnetic releases, right? further and further automation. We get then the development in the 30s of movie camera systems. And these are, I just, I love these. I think these are really beautiful objects. And this is called, called uh, the Kirby Two Eyes system. The inventor was a guy named Gustavus Kirby. And this is using a movie camera system. You're seeing it here in a tower and it's, um, you know, to get the, to get a proper vantage point. And what it does is it trains one lens on the race and one lens on a chronograph over here. And so what you get, because it's movie camera system, is a continuous recording. Instead of a static image, you get this continuous recording. And with that, the timer. So if we look at this image in the top left, you're seeing zero minutes, uh, looks to be just at 10 seconds and maybe 24 one hundredths, right? And that's gonna be this runner here. So on one hand, we have this further automation, further aspects of non-intervention, and a, um, but an additional uh, benefit in that because you're, you're doing this continuous recording, now we can record the times of every athlete that crosses. And so uh, again, to dovetail with Marcus's, this allows you more and more records. So no longer just depicting the first and second or third, right? Because your still photograph can only capture who crosses first and second and whoever else happens to be in the photographic frame. Now with the movie camera system, you're capturing everyone. So you can have results for everybody, right? That, that leads, and if you look back in Olympic reports, what you see in early Olympic reports is first, second, and third. And then you start to see all athletes depicted, right? So you can see how this kind of changes the sporting landscape as well because you might have somebody who finished in ninth, but they set a record for their nation, right? And that becomes important. And now we have a visual and textual account of it. So shortly after, so the movie camera system doesn't really take off. The reason being, it is almost immediately supplanted by the true photo finish camera, which is the slit camera. And I'm showing you here the um, uh, patent for that. The slit camera has a really fascinating history because it is developed in conjunction with the Hollywood movie studios. The person who develops it is a guy named Lorenzo Del Riccio, and he's an optical engineer for Paramount Studios. Um, Bing Crosby uh, and a couple of other Hollywood, well, the other, the other two, I wouldn't say were A-listers, they were more B-listers, but Bing Crosby and a couple of Hollywood friends purchase a horse racing track. And for their grand opening, they want to have the latest and greatest, which includes the best uh, finish line system. And so they enlist the help of Del Riccio, an optical engineer, to say, what can you do? How can you help us out in this regard? And so he comes up with the slit camera. And so if you remember the, the previous one, the Kirby Two Eyes, that's still um, 
a film-based camera. And so what it is is a series of still images captured you know, very, very rapidly and then projected rapidly. So it seems like a continuous band, but it's actually still a series of still images. What happens in that, and this is where the, the um, horse racing, the debate in the horse racing community is so incredible at this time, because they start to discuss the possibility that the finish might actually take place in the tiny little moments between the still frames on a continuous strip of photographic film. And I, I remember reading one case where these um, uh, finish line judges are poring over a series of images with magnifying glasses, trying to determine if the, if, the, if the nostril of a horse comes to a finish before the end of the photographic pane or impedes slightly into it, right? So it gets down to that level um, of precision, which is really incredible. And there was a really in-depth and healthy debate in the racing community about the efficacy of these systems. Um, and it's something that, I, that I, I don't think we have today at the same level, which I find really interesting. I was really surprised at just how thorough um, and nuanced the discussion was in these early systems. Um, I'm just gonna do this. I think I'm getting some too much glare. There we go. I thought I was maybe fading away and becoming a ghost. Spirit photography. So Del Riccio, Del Riccio solves this problem of this of this the repeated film frames by the slit camera, which operates with a continuous stream of film behind it, not film frames, but a continuous band of film. And then instead of an aperture that opens up, you have a slit. And so the slit for his was one eighteen thousandth of an inch wide. And then the way it works is that your slit is open here. And it's trained on the finish line. And then as your runners or horses or bicycles cross over the line like this, the film moves at the same speed behind the slit. And so all the information that's going through the slit is recorded onto the film and it's continuous. There's no interruption, right? So the way that I said I would, I would tell you later about why this one on the right was a photograph of a finish, this one on the left is a photo finish. It's done using a slit camera, okay? The reason that you see that some of those limbs are elongated and others aren't, those are indications where the speed of the limb or the part of the body is either slower or faster than the speed of the film. So you set your speed of the film to run at the speed of the athletes, and so that's why the torsos generally tend to be clear and, and quote unquote normal, whereas the limbs look extended and elongated and strange. And that's because they're going either slower or faster than the speed of the film. Okay. So this largely solves all the previous. Oh, sorry. Marcio, did you have a. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you about those numbers in the upper side. It's um, it's the time of the, the or it's of yeah. The, okay. Yeah. So yeah, I I'm gonna have to go on a, I have to go on a slight tangent because I'm and I'm so glad you asked that because it is so fascinating to me. <laughs> so what that is, and this yeah. This, and this is why photo fin this is why true photo finishes are very complicated looking objects because they they are made to look like photographs traditional photographs including this information up here so what that is is it's telling you the year of the games the day so 48 there is 1948 and I believe your five and one is likely month and day or something like that what the way that happens is there is a drum very very small, on the opposite side of the finish line from the fin from the slit camera. And on that drum is printed that information. And it spins at a speed that is as fast as the moving film. And so it appears as a static banner, but it's not, it's actually a tiny little drum. And this is the way, and I'm not gonna talk about this part in the, in the, in the talk today, but I have to bring it in because it's so amazing. This is the way Omega inserts themselves into the Omega, the company inserts themselves into the Olympics because prior to LA 84, there was really, there was no commercial involvement allowed. So in the early days of the Olympics, there's no businesses, no commercial sign anywhere. 
Omega is providing all this technology. And what they do is they add their name on this drum. And so it says Omega race finish camera. Nobody can see it because it's so small but it gets printed on every single photo finish image, right? So they're getting this advertising out there. It's an absolute evil genius move. Really, really smart. Anyways, so to go back to the distinction between these, what happens is an inversion of the traditional relationship of the photograph. So the one that is a photograph of a finish captures a distinct amount of space, right? So I'll say like I don't know, 500 meters squared or whatever for sake of argument in a very particular time. The photo finish, by contrast, captures a very tiny amount of space over time, right? And so this image on the left, which looks as though it is showing all the athletes as they are coming up to and crossing the finish line, is actually thousands and thousands of tiny little slices of the finish line recombined in the order of the athletes finished. So what you're seeing here is actually every athlete and every athlete's body at the precise moment they cross the finish line. But it's recombined to show, to recombine to show them the order with which they crossed the line. Okay. Is that is that clear enough? Okay. And so by the time we have this you get into that full non-interventionist impulse, right? This is just now machinic recording of results. Therefore, the results are going to be infallible. Um, I'm going to jump way ahead. This is a uh, from a press release in 2008 by Omega. This was a controversial finish between Millerad Savage and Michael Phelps. I don't know if anybody remembers. Savage touched the wall first, but Phelps, but he didn't touch it with enough pressure to set the timer off before Michael Phelps hit it with enough pressure to set the timer off. So Phelps, even though he touched after Savage, won the race. There was controversy, et cetera, et cetera. Omega comes out with this line that could, that you know, was almost written for my project, which is there is no human intervention between the athlete and the measurement of his or his, his or her performance. So this satisfies this kind of um, discourse around non-interventionist objectivity that is actively promoted by the timing and imaging companies that are doing this work, who really work to say, this is just this is just pure machinic objectivity. There can be no doubt as to the performance here. But what is shown in the case of the Savage and Phelps, and now I come back to this one, is that no matter how precise the technology or whatnot gets, we're still dealing with a world that is made up of messy, imperfect materials and bodies that are messy and imperfect. And so the reason that the cameras in the women's 100 meter could not separate Tarmo and Felix is because of, and this was a quote from the judge, a rotated and obscured torso. And so what happened as Tarmo crossed the line was she twisted and the camera could not then capture definitively what part of the torso was the forwardmost part, right? And so even at 3000, even at 5000 frames per second, we can't separate them. So this history then is a continued history of trying to solve what are perceived to be human problems. Um, and one of the things I'm going to, I'm going to get to towards the next section is sport is human, right? So you can only go so far. Um, if you truly want irrefutable, perfect results, then you have to remove the human. Right? And I don't think we want to go that direction in sport. Okay. Oh, sorry. I need to show you this one. Um, uh, this one is uh, Mo Farah. This is just another example of even when everything is right, it can go wrong. This is Mo Farah who runs, gets the double gold, which is incredibly rare in track and field, running on home soil, 2012 uh, London Games. So he's already won the 10,000. This is when he wins the 5,000. There's uh, 80,000 fans in the stands. They're cheering at 140 decibels, which is a jet engine at takeoff, 10 times the level uh, threshold for human pain. They cheer so loud that it shakes the photo finish equipment because the equipment is attached to the facility and the facility is shaking so hard that it shakes the equipment. Now, this one didn't come down to a photo finish. 
But the reason I, I bring it is that it shook. And so your photo, so imagine if you're trying to pour over the photo finish image here and you've got a shaky result, right? So yet again, another example of the technology, the precision of the technology can only, you know, has limits and it's limited by humans. In this case, 80,000 fans screaming, which shakes the equipment. Okay. Accuracy versus precision. Along with this march towards non-intervention, there seems to be, and sometimes actively promoted, a discourse that if we get more precise, we get more accurate. And I think, you know, just as humans, we would probably say, yes, that makes sense. If we can get more and more precise data, we then our accurates are going to, or our results are going to be more and more accurate. If we can get more and more decimal places, then we're going to get more accurate, right? I was operating under that same assumption, looking at those cameras that are capturing 3,000 and 5,000 scans, thinking, surely we must be able to get these results. So these are three examples, uh, a Prosh triplex shutter, which Hemet used, which captured three one hundredths of a second. Omega ScanoVision, which is, is the red camera here, that captures 10 thousandths of a second. And that one is, that one is predominantly uh, the one that's in use now. Um, the Omega Quantum Timer, it's not a, not a uh, imaging device, but a timer, can break the second to the millionths. Okay. That is extremely impressive that something can break the second to the millionths, that we can have cameras that can break the second into the ten thousandths. It's very, very impressive. But what I want to say is that it is, in terms of the world of sports and decision making, irrelevant. Here's what I mean by that. If we take the women's 100 meter, I put it down to 10 seconds uh, for ease of ease of math. This gives you a sense of how much space they are covering at a given time interval. So at a hundredth of a second, they cover 10 centimeters of distance. At a thousandth of a second, they cover 10 millimeters. At a 10 thousandth of a second, they cover one millimeter, right? Here's the data on the inside and outside camera and therefore how much movement they were capturing, right? So differences between Tarmo and Felix is, you know, that 5,000 scans, they're capturing two millimeters of space and seven millimeters of space. And so the precision would seem to suggest that, yes, we can do this. Here are their times. They're separated by the thousandth. But the measurement of the track, like the, so a, the construction of a track or a pool or any sport venue um, can never be perfect, right? And so every athletics or sport federation has its rules and regulations for how the venue has to be constructed. For a track, you have a dimensional tolerance of plus minus 0 0.01 meter or 10 millimeters, okay? Which means any two measurements can be different by 10 millimeters. Okay. That makes sense. 400 meter oval, right? Plus minus 10 millimeters. The same happens with the pool, right? The difficulty is, and this is where the precision and accuracy, so accuracy comes across here. Precision is now going higher than accuracy. So when we get down in the Felix and Tarmo case to measuring to the thousandth of a second, because remember that's how they were differentiated. 11.067 to 11.068 thousandths of a second. You're measuring 10 millimeters difference. That is allowable. That can be an allowable difference for track measurement, right? So the point is at that level, you might be measuring the difference in track length rather than a difference in performance, right? So you can't definitively say that measuring to the thousandth effectively separates athletes by performance. It could be that athlete A ran 10 millimeters farther than athlete B. Okay. This is compounded <laughs> by the fact that sports governing bodies do not have clear language around this or clear language around how they measure results. Okay. So I'm giving you here swimming track and field and skiing. And I've got my Hayward field board down here to show you again that the results down here, remember, were, were displayed to the hundredth, 11.07. 
even though they were differentiated at the thousandth. So this explains why this chart here. So swimming, you time to the hundredth or the thousandth. Track and field, you time to the thousandth. Uh, skiing, you time to at least the thousandth. Results, hundred, hundred, hundred. Okay. What do you do with the third digit? If you recorded it, swimming, you drop it. Track and field, you round it up to the next hundredth. Skiing, you drop it. Tide determined by hundreds, thousands, hundreds. So we take our track and field example. Tarmo and Felix are separated by the thousandth. That's according to the rules. Their results are rounded up to the next hundredth, which is 11.07. The difficulty is why record to the thousandth or the ten thousandths if you're going to drop those digits and your results are recorded to the hundredth, right? It doesn't make any sense to say that we're going to record to the ten thousandths, but we're going to drop any digits past the hundredth. Right? Because what it does is it leads to confusion from athletes, particularly from sports journalists, who get wind of this and know that the timers and the cameras are recording to the thousandths or the ten thousandths. And then they start to say things like, well, who really won? Because we know that you recorded this, right? And the sports governing bodies have done virtually nothing to address the fact that those high levels of precision aren't necessarily accurate in terms of performance. Okay, so I give you this example here. Uh, Maze and Gizan tie for uh, gold at the Olympics. And we have Peekaboo Street, former US ski team racer, uh, commentating for Fox Sports. I want to get that person and just like beat it out of them. If it's gaugeable, let us have it. Give it to me. Give me that thousandth, right? Because she knows that it records to the thousandth. Daniel Beaumont, vice president of Swiss Timing. That's the parent company of Omega. Still in the timing control group, three people, the head timer, a backup timer, and a computer operator saw who won the race according to the timing data. No one, including FIS, was informed of the actual winner. That is forbidden. Now, Beaumont knows better. He knows that the, the, the precision doesn't count at that level. I know this from talking to other timers who told me that people in the timing community are aware of this limitation, but he's also the vice president of the company whose equipment is being used and is promoting it as giving infallible results. So here he's actually putting responsibility on the Federation saying no one, including the FIS, was informed of the winner. That is forbidden, right? As if we know, Omega, we know who won, but FIS won't allow us to tell you, right? Jenny Whiteke attempts to, to quash this, coming out with this thing that says, when you start getting into such small numbers, you cannot guarantee the integrity of that number. It's an outdoor sport in a winter climate. A piece of flesh could be the difference, okay? So one of the things that was striking to me is there's no there's no discussion or statement about the ineffectiveness of timing past the hundredth for most sports. Um, instead, and as actively promoted by timing companies, there's this discourse of the more precise we get, the more accurate we get. The more decimal places, the more assured you can be that our decisions are correct. Right? Um, but it's not because we play sport outdoors and on natural environments and we play sport in, with human bodies, which are not perfect. Uh, so I'll give you this last one here. I've only got uh, two slides for you. I, I, I promise I'm almost done. Uh, this is February 1928, Pyeongchang Games. A tie for gold with an aggregate time of three minutes, 16 and 86 hundreds. Now, I I mean, to this day, I'm stunned by this. Four runs each, and the aggregate time is exactly the same to the hundredth of a second. Cathal Kelly from the Globe and Mail, a Canadian paper and one of my favorite sports reporters, does this disservice to the tie. Olympic clocks are capable of measuring to the ten thousandth of a second, but a hundredth is the accepted maximum in bobsleigh. If the official timekeepers know the truth of it, they are sworn to secrecy, right? And this is a completely incorrect statement. <laughs> there is no truth of it. They tied to the 86-100. That is extraordinary and should be celebrated as such. But because we measure to the 10,000th, Kelly is assuming, there must be a true result. So why not go to the 10,000th, right?
So we've had about 140 years of the use of technology to determine placing in sport. Hemet and Marx, I you remember at the beginning, claimed that uh, we were going to eventually, uh, or that we had finally eradicated the dead heat. We've seen a mythic quest for perfect vision, for pure performance and its pure measurement. Um, and I wonder if this isn't instead a case of uh, Evgeny Muratsov's technological solutionism, where we're creating a technology to solve a problem that doesn't actually exist. Um, for me, that problem is a dead heat, which I don't think is a problem. I think if two people tie, we should celebrate the tie. Uh, my concluding here is that there is such a thing as a dead heat. There should be more of them. We should acknowledge and celebrate this, but we probably won't. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to chat. Thank you so much. That's, thanks so much, Jonathan. It's fascinating. Uh, I love your your vision on vision on visualization. Actually, <laughs> it's uh, so it's so nice, and I have a lot of questions. And if anyone has any question, you can ask it for Jonathan, or you can send it or or on chat in Portuguese, and I can, I can translate. But I was thinking about in I was thinking when I. Uh, was reading your book about, um, I don't know, this kind of um, impulse of like, it seems to me that the same technology that proposes accuracy and precision is the one that encourages discussion about those same results, results. like hmm. kind of paradox between a desire for precision like you said, and the desire to, I don't know, stay in the trouble, to quote an highway out of place here, but like to, to stay with this, this mass that uh, propose uh, a discussion on media and between people that uh, watch sports. I don't know if you think about, how do you think about it? Yeah, it's a good, yeah, it's a good point. Be, um, and I think we see that with VAR a fair bit yeah. more. Yeah, I um, exactly. Yeah, because because I I think so we're seeing it there, and that's why I say I was so surprised, but in a very happy way to see all the discussion in the horse racing community around movie camera systems, and and you know they they talk about the problem of parallax and having the camera elevated yeah. too high up, like they really get into the weeds in it, um, in a way that we don't with, like so the photo finish is still just simply accepted as this kind of irrefutable evidence. Yeah. Um, and VAR, I think you're right. Um, Hawkeye tends to be accepted, um, even though, you know, it's it's predictive. I think Marcus talked about that in his, but also Collins and Evans in, in their work, right? Like they show that it has a margin of error that is simply ignored um, in the presentation of evidence. So yeah. it's it seems to be case by case. It is It is curious why VAR in football especially seems to be, generating the discussion and i don't know i mean maybe some of that is the both size and knowledge base of the and knowledge of the fan base yeah yeah it, it can be yeah yeah you are right because those uh, in racing there is no question about the precision of this technology it's kind of the opposite because we don't ask you we, we think that this is transparent and this is so objectivity and there's a lot of uh but we, we like we don't know how we as uh sports watchers and even journalists we don't know exactly how it works and i believe you try to uh open the back black box uh, you are opening the black box for us and trying to show how it works and there is this faith in uh, the precision of the technology, and there's not a lot of question about the, how uh, that this is not so precise as all as it was showing us, something like that, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I mean, I always try and... Uh, ask ask my students where they think we're going to go with this and i you know you yeah. can imagine okay so if a problem is you can't separate tarmo and felix because the cameras are this way 
what if you do a 360 or maybe not a 360, but a 180, right? You have yeah. you make the entire field the visible, right? Or do you um, chip, implant something or paint yeah. something on the skin, right? So you paint something on the athlete's skin. Like what, you know, we know that this is, we know that the, the attempts to solve this are not going to go away, right? Yeah, exactly. But, but you're still dealing with a human, right? So, you know, how are you going to make sure that it is exact the way you chip or the way you paint across the skin or something, right? Like there's always going to be um, an imperfection that you're dealing with. And I think that, uh, I mean, to me, I think we should acknowledge that, right? Yeah. Acknowledge that we, we may have reached the limit with this <laughs> and <laughs> so be it. Congratulations to us, right? We have this wonderful equipment. We're going to make sure we're no longer going to time to the 10,000th because we know we can't really justify any of the results past the hundredth. If yeah. and when we come up with something, right? But like, there's no, there's just no acknowledgement of that. And and I understand why, because, um, and this is where I, I, I take a bit of issue with one of the recommendations of Collins and Evans, who say that Hawkeye is used in tennis when they broadcast it, they should put like in out, you know, plus or with a confidence interval, plus minus 90%. Yeah. Really. And, but that, that, you know, that to me is, that can't happen in sports entertainment, right? What audience member is going to want to know that the definitive decision of in or out is, eh, there's some wiggle room or who really wants to know about the dimensional tolerances of a track, right? It's yeah. far more exciting <laughs> to get first, second, and third. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, one of the most fascinating things of our books is uh, the uh, this history of the reaction time between the photographer and the the action. This is fascinating because th that's the problem. That's the human problem. Is that exactly? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And and there's the like one of the reasons I got interested in it is that there's a lot of work uh, in in sports studies around um attempts to uh what um train you know focusing on the training of the body and like you know getting yeah. like doing things to the body to make it as perfect and whatnot as possible and so what i was doing was looking on the opposite side was not attempts to improve performance but the way that we measure performance right and the way that we judge performance and record it and so and that's that's also a very human problem right but you can't you can't solve root. So I don't know, maybe, maybe we need to work on our reaction time. Maybe there should be more studies with that, right? Like you can't, we're not working on those kinds of things. There's so much attention to um, uh, the athlete and monitoring the performance in that side, but uh, little attention paid on the other side, how we make these determinations. Yeah, exactly. So Marcelo ask you, asks, uh, in general, how do you relate the photo finish to the challenge? already used in tennis and volleyball and do you believe that this technology is fundamental to maintaining the credibility of sport uh sorry you, you cut out a tiny bit right in the middle so relating the photo finish to what the challenge um, okay uh, well in nfl you use uh, yeah i believe this challenge system also yeah well so i think what you see there is the uh, push and pull that happens with the adoption of any technology into a sport yeah. because you put it in and then it has unintended impacts and then you then have to regulate against those. And I think the challenge is a way to do that, right? Um, to mitigate that it completely slows the game down. Mm -hmm. um, but what I think what's so interesting with those is that they've become part of the game, right? So you can you can throw you can throw a challenge challenge to slow to slow momentum right rather than to actually challenge a result you you can you can challenge even though you know you're not going to win the thing but you do it in order to slow the game down quash your opponent's momentum or something else right and so the decision making technology has become a strategy as well a, a, as part of the game um or in cases like hawkeye especially in tennis it's become uh you know, it's it's part of the entertainment. It's part of the broadcast. So when you watch for those for those who watch tennis, you'll know this. Everybody participates in that decision. The players stop. The fans are all there. The broadcast is carrying it, and we watch the ball go. Oh, and it bounces in or out. Right? There's a big. There's a sort of collective moment where we're all participating together. 
And so it's fascinating the way that, that decision making has become part of the sport and part of the broadcast. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the photo, so the photo finish, I think, is different in the sense that it seems to it, it seems to exist separately and on its own, and it's unquestioned, and it's just you know, it's I don't think if you were if you were to poll people on the street, I don't think any of them would think there's a human being sitting behind a laptop clicking. <laughs> I think they would yeah. assume it's all automated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the same with uh, VAR, video system referee right now. It, it, there's a lot of people there and there's a referee and he's uh, pointing and clicking in the, in the image. So, but uh, people don't, don't think about it. If they think about like it's a kind of automatic thing, but it's not. Yeah. 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 And at least there, there's a discussion around the... Um, what it does to the game, you know? Yes. Uh, and I and I think, and I, I see a little bit around uh, NFL as well about, uh, do we really need to go to a point about looking at blades of grass, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and whether the ball, you know, like looking whether the ball contacted these blades of grass across the goal line or not, you know, like, are, are we, are we taking this too far? And so you're right that, you know, there is, there is nice discussion around there. I would like to see that discussion across the sporting landscape. Yeah. Um, uh, because I think, you know, yeah, this, this exists in almost every sport and it would be nice to see it toned back a little bit to sort of uh, celebrate the humanity behind all this <laughs> rather than. Yeah. Uh, rather than yeah, yeah. I always remember uh, a, a quote from Gilberto Gil, uh, Brazilian musician and former uh, minister, minister of Culture here in Brazil, and uh, I believe in uh, 98, something like that, one World Cup uh, in the last century, he, he, he was talking about the replay, video replay, and I read this idea of the objectivity of the technology against the objectivity of the human and he says something like, uh, it doesn't matter at all, at all because everything that happens in a field, in a pitch, in, inside the, the game is from and of the game. It's because of the game. This mm -hmm. is the reality of the game. It's not the reality of the technology and anyone outside of the game. So if the referee sees and, say that, and says, he saw that and not this. This is the reality because he created this reality. And I, I think this idea is fascinating because it goes against that instinct to use technology as an overarching thing to uh, be more precise than the human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, when they with the offside technology that was rolled out for World Cup, that to me gets yeah. us like we're really close there to just constant surveillance of every aspect of the pitch, right? Like sort of yeah. omni surveillance. Um, and I think that you know that that clearly seems to be a step too far, right? Yes. Uh, but there's this I don't know. There's the sort of march of technology that seem that that. Uh, and and the companies behind it, which do a terrific job at promoting the value of it and whatnot. Um, and as the stakes go up in terms of money and gambling, uh, yeah, and contracts and what you know, th that that seems like a, a an inevitable future. Yeah, uh, it's kind of solution or uh, uh, accountability, and we can say that of FIFA when uh, because of this mo money laundering and scandals and so so on and i believe that there is this use of technology as a public relations thing yeah. like we can use it like public relations yeah well and that was that was the case with the the felix and tarmo one right is that yeah. there's there's nervousness around lawsuits yeah making a decision because it wasn't provable through recourse to an image. There was no image that they could show and say, see, 
Tarmo was crossing out. Instead, what you had was a judge who's one of very few recognized international photo finish judges, right? Everybody recognizes his expertise, but it wasn't enough, right? Yeah. So they defer to the image and the image says tie, right? So yeah, you're, you're, I mean, you're, you're right there that there's a very interesting sort of uh, political move going on behind, behind the sidelines there in terms of the, the terms of the run and its performance, Jennings' decision was right because that's the way that's in the rules. That's how it's done. That's the way we've been doing it. Um, but uh, there's nervousness around litigation, so they 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 pulled the decision back. Yes, uh, the uses uh, the uses of the image and the technology, right? So I, I was thinking also uh, on the historical side of your of your work. Uh, this relation between uh, movements and the still image in phot photography, uh, all right? So there is this idea, and I believe this is a, a, a very uh, ninth century thing to think that movement is real or more real than the still image, than the photography. Like, we can now with movement, we can know for sure that this is the first and this, this is the second. But, and I believe there, there is, uh, I, I think about how, maybe how current photography from Melbourne and Maria and, and this idea of the, the uh, mainly Melbourne that, Melbourne that tries to, create this idea of the movie image and this uh, what cinema will, will do afterwards like it's more real than photography I, do, I don't know if you know some from some from that yeah well yeah I, and I I think that that um I think that that continues right I think there's kind of a historical march for that up yeah. to digital HD, right, as getting more and more real. And maybe that links yeah. up with the idea of precision and more and more accurate. Um, and I it's, so I think if we, if there'd be, there's an interesting discussion there, thinking through Dastin and Gallison yeah. again, around yeah. the, they talk about uh, Crystaller leaving, leaving tattered tissues on his cells as a way to indicate that this is real, right? Because, the cleaned up image, the image that was too clean and too precise might be perceived as being automated or something like that, right? And so the idea of sort of letting nature speak for itself there, right? And so maybe there's, I mean, that's something I didn't really do in the book, but it would be pretty fascinating to think about the photo finish image as accomplishing that, right? That those elongated limbs and whatnot yeah. are sort of, are sort of, for, what? A further level of proof that this is, you know, yeah. kind of a spe special image, right? Um, and yeah, you're right because because it's it shows it's but I don't know it shows its inability to capture movement precisely, I guess, or something like that. Like there's there's a way in which that image compared to the standard photograph looks wrong, but maybe it's maybe it's precisely that imperfection. That signals it as a special object. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I was thinking about uh, Friedrich Kittler, and he talks about just that, like how those marks or those errors in the image or anything that is recorded by technical media, it's the index of the real. Like this is this yeah. is it. it's the error, not the the content of the. So, and there's another one, I think it's, I could be wrong on this, but I think it's Tom Levin who talks about the um, the, tr the truthfulness of real-time imaging. Uh, and he's, I think he's talking specifically about CCTV and surveillance imagery mm -hmm. as being, as supplanting the um, indexicality of the still image, right? And right. you can see, you can sort of see that playing. And so, you know, that, that, I think that discussion leads into like reality TV and whatnot, like the way the cameras are set up and everything are meant to indicate the real in a way that, you know, 
And, and so the blurriness, the graininess, the the messiness, those are all indications that this is more accurate. You're getting like a, you know. Yeah, yeah. And what it'd be, it, 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 and so it would, it's interesting to think then about VAR or any kind of sideline, goal line technology um, uh, and the, the claims to reality that are being made from that kind of footage, right? That this is, yeah. I mean, those are at one at one on one hand, those are very, very precise and kind of perfect looking images as you just see the ball over and over and over again. Um, but at the same time, they're the product. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure if it lines up with that or not. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, when we last spoke in Amsterdam last year, I was presented as uh, the Chira Teiman, that is a Brazilian technologist that precedes the video system and made this new technology of FIFA World, last FIFA World Cup. And I, I love this technology because it was used in Brazil for a long 20 years, since the 80s, and it was very popular. And I didn't know that it's kind of audited from here, from Brazil. It's uh, Spanish and maybe Italian technology. We don't know. We, we couldn't find at all who invented it but we use since the 80s and i remember this episode in world cup maybe to uh, brazilian in brazil 2014 and there is uh there was not var but there is a goal line technology i believe this time and it proves officially from fifa that Brazilian, the Brazil goal against Cameroon wasn't a goal, wasn't allowed. But if you look through uh, Chiratema, Brazilian Chiratema, it is a goal. It's it's very clear that it's it works. So there is a lot of this discussion in Brazilian press that uh, uh, the FIFA technology is uh, padrão FIFA, or how we call it here in Brazil like every everything must be in this international pattern is, is international standard of fifa but yeah. the, the technology wasn't wasn't so there is a lot of this discussion about colonization like they try and they are coming with this technology and trying to sell it sell it like it's real uh, this is it and now we know for sure what is and what is not, but our technology or Brazilian technology is better than this yeah. international one. So there's a lot of discussion about, and I, I think it's fascinating how uh, even technology or even how technology, we think about technology and then we always think about uh, uh, those technologies coming from uh, the global north, of course, of the United States and, and, uh, and so on, and how even technology and uh, can be used as an uh, agent uh, against colonization or against, I don't know, or try to create something that is really unique uh, inside a, a nation or inside a culture, maybe that, that's the idea. Because Juratem is very Brazilian. <laughs> And so we are not, ah, no, we, we don't like this technology from outside because ours is better. But there is no Chiratema since this, this was the last cup that World Cup that was used. And so on, we now, uh, and everyone, like everyone else, else we use uh, visual assistant referee and all the official technology. So I, I believe this, I remember it, I, I believe this is. <laughs> A nice example of how technology can be used also as a form of resistance, maybe. Yeah, so it, that's that's interesting because I, I remember when I was looking through, through uh, all the Olympic contracts for the Olympic Games and Olympic reports and whatnot in the early years. And so and what I was what I was looking for there is how how particularly Omega became the leader in the field yeah. right that was through a series of just continued contract negotiations where they outbid or sometimes out muscled other people there was sometimes seiko would get in and be able to pro provide the equipment but it was mainly omega and, or swiss timing and all of their subsidiaries and one of the things that was kind of a side note to that was that in the early iterations in the earlier iterations of the games 
so much of the work would be done and given through local companies. So you'd have your local Olympic organizing committee and they would, you know, parcel out the contracts to whomever for doing what kind of work, referees and such not would be pulled from that country. And more and more of that disappears as the games progress, right? Yeah. In, to closer to the present. And then you start to have multinationals. Nope, Omega is going to do all of this. And they're providing all their staff and all of their staff and all of their referees are going to come with the equipment and do the job for you. Right. So yeah, there was there's a really interesting shift, gradual, between yeah. a lot of local involvement to then basically just, you know, signing on to the brand that it's going to be Omega, it's going to be Coca-Cola, it's going to be this. And right. And like, and because they have spent, you know, tens of millions of dollars on contracts with the IOC to have the rights to the games. Yeah, we have it in broadcasting also, uh, at least World Cup, that was uh, what I studied some time ago. Uh, uh, from 2002 um, onwards, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the same group. It's the same group that do all the broadcasts. Until the late 90s, uh, it was uh, one television from the country and he uh, that made all the the transmission the broadcasting and sell it to fifa but now fifa has their own thing like uh, so uh, there is this idea of uh standardization maybe uh, that's the yeah. issue uh, at all yeah i so i remember from that and i can't remember if it was your presentation or not at the one in amsterdam yeah. But um, I'd asked about the what the technology was because all of the cameras and whatnot just have FIFA on them. And yeah. so there was no way to know what are they using, right? Like what's what is the equipment? Are they making their own, right? But so there's a really interesting, not just branding, but a kind of obfuscating there of we don't even know what the material is and who the people are operating and whatnot because it seems to be just FIFA, right? Yeah, FIFA don't yeah. make cameras. What are the cameras? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there, there is this uh, aesthetic, uh, aesthetics uh, change over time uh, before this standardization. So since the, the last ones, it's always the same because of this idea of uh, no, now we have a, our team, uh, now we will do uh, the way we want to to do it so yeah i believe that is kind of a loss i believe for the yeah. game yeah so uh anna marcelo mari any other question for jonathan let's see if it's someone pronounced <laughs> all right so Jonathan, I don't want to take you another time, another for time. Thanks so much for, for being here. I love the discussion. I love your presentation. I love your book. I, I already told you. I, oh, I didn't know uh, your PG about uh, CCTV, right? Oh, no, uh, criminal, photo, criminal photograph. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to check this one. Yeah history of the use of photography by police to identify criminals yeah yeah i'm gonna check this one too nice <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a fun one but the photo finish was by far the most the most fun project yeah yeah i remember you you wrote uh or you wrote a, a paper or uh, i believe it was one of the editor of a modern issue on sports visuals yeah. some time ago yeah yeah, yeah. That was the that was the very very start of it. That was a long time ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was very nice. Yeah. Well, thanks. nice. So thanks so much, Jonathan. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for yeah. sharing. Thank thank you very much. Loved it. Thanks thanks everybody for for attending, and I hope I hope everybody's well. Yeah, you too. So take care and keep in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. See you next Thursday.